Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Adam Miller, a digital journalist with The Herald. I've been involved in the Don't Be That Guy campaign, which aims to tackle male sexual entitlement in Scotland. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2023 Festival of Politics. This year's event celebrates the festival's 19th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. I look forward to this discussion and hearing everyone's thoughts and views. It's important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, even when there may be differences of opinion, and that we treat each other respectfully at all times. We're delighted that you can join us today to participate in talking to boys and men about gender-based violence in partnership with Glasgow Caledonian University. Later, I'll be inviting you to get involved with questions and comments. If you're keen to continue to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so using the at Visit Scott Parle Twitter account or via Instagram. I should also add that the event is being live streamed today on the Parliament's SPTV channel. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Sandy Brindley, Graham Goulden and Professor Nancy Lombard. Sandy Brindley is the Chief Executive of Rape Crisis Scotland and has been involved in the rape crisis movement in Scotland for more than 25 years. Graham Goulden is a retired Scottish police officer who also worked with the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit. Graham now works across the UK and in the US supporting the prevention of violence in communities, sports teams, workplaces and universities. Professor Nancy Lombard is a professor in sociology and social policy at Glasgow Caledonian University. Much of her research looks at violence, gender and young people. There will be an opportunity for members of the audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. However, I would like to open by asking a few questions for each of our panellists. So I'll put this one out there for all three of you. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has described violence against women and girls as being maybe the world's longest, deadliest pandemic. Would you agree with that statement? And I'll open that to anyone who wants to take it. Starting um, with that, just uh, uh, absolutely, I, I think it is one of the most significant international human rights issues facing us. I, I think the scale of violence against women and girls is both overwhelming and hidden, but I think if you scratch the surface of any woman's life, you will see how it has impacted either directly or indirectly in terms of how women often curtail our lives because of the threat of male violence. And I think it's important to see violence against women as part of a spectrum from rape to domestic abuse to what's often trivialised or seen as much more minor around street harassment. And I think what's clear is we need to do much more both to protect women and girls and assist women and girls to access justice when they have experienced violence against women, but also crucially in terms of the subject of our talk today, to really transform our culture and how it views women, in particular how it views women's sexuality in male attitudes, particularly within heterosexual relationships. Because I think if we don't do that, we are not going to tackle the epidemic of violence against women and girls. And how about yourselves? I, you, you, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that Sandy said. And I know that um, particularly in the research that I've done with primary school children, um, we know that this is experienced by, by girls within primary school as well. And often these experiences are normalised. So we know that it's an epidemic. We know that it's a systematic um, based upon gender inequalities throughout societies. But we also know um, that girls normalise a lot of this behaviour that they experience and then only come to, to see it as wrong um, when they're told where it's named as, as violent against women as well. I think for me it's really important that we're having this conversation about men's violence and that, that, that doesn't you know, exclude men as victims of violence, often by, the, other, by often by other boys and men as well. But I think, and I think it's important to realise that many of the social issues we have in our, our society, you know, if you think about knife related violence, other issues, the backstory is often things like domestic violence in homes. So there'll never be peace on our streets until we have peace in the home, never peace in the world until we have peace in the home. And you know, over the last few years, if you look at some of the terrorist incidents around, around, around the globe, the backstory has often been um, domestic abuse in the home. So I think it's important for everybody in this room to consider that, rather than just looking at this as just one, one particular issue. 
Jim, you've been involved in the Don't Be That Guy campaign. How would you suggest people engage the men and boys in their lives in meaningful conversations about gender-based violence? You know, over, the, over the last years, my, my, my lens has completely transformed. A big help to Nancy and, and Sandy have really helped sort of alter my lens. But a lot of the views that I have today are not so much my views, but the science, the science of prevention. And I think one thing I've really learned is that what doesn't work with boys and men is telling them that bad things will happen to them if you do bad things or, or just stop doing bad things. And we need to have that conversation at times. But what does work for me is helping boys and men better understand what their peers think. Because in the main, our, our sons, our, our men are healthy individuals, but they just don't realise what their peers are thinking. And I think this destructive influence of, the, of their friends um, can lead to them you know, joining in with certain behaviours or ignoring certain behaviours and walking away. So I think it's important that we start to you know, realise that, you know, get them to listen to each other, learn more about each other. And I, I'd love to do more around how do we define that word loyalty amongst friendship groups? You know, if you think about the work that I do in, with, with policing in the US and policing here in the UK, how do we redefine that term loyalty? What, what, is, what does it mean to be loyal to your friend? So these are, these are big things that I've learned over the years that I think that works when, when you're working, especially with boys and men. Nancy, do you think young men in 2023 have a greater understanding of and maybe empathy towards women's lived experience of violence than maybe they did have in the past? I think some men do. Um, I think there's been a lot of fantastic campaigns, such as the ones that you've worked on yourself and the um, Scottish Rape Crisis have done. And I think that's really helped to inform um, boys and men's understanding of, um, of men's violence against women. But I also think there's a lot of really entrenched attitudes that haven't changed the way that, that men still view women. Um, when I worked in, in primary schools and, and talked to, to boys, not only about violence, but also about gender, they had very, very fixed ideas of, of what women were and how women should behave. And those, in turn, inform their ideas about relationships, about what women should do or shouldn't do within relationships and how women should act. So I think those are still prevalent um, today. And I think when we talk about men and boys, we've also got to think about that intersectional analysis. So looking at, at men and boys, not as this homogenous group of people, but looking through, through those lenses of, of class, ethnicity, um, disability. Um, so looking at those, those different aspects of, of men and boys too. Sandy, several social media creators who are popular online uh, promote very misogynistic attitudes. I'm sure most of us here will be familiar with the likes of Andrew Tate. Um, what effect do you think this has and how can we go about combating it? I think it does have a significant impact. We do a prevention programme in schools, because I'm speaking with young people about consent and healthy relationships. And on the whole, I would say that boys engage very well in these discussions and really there's a real appetite to talk about what does consent mean, what does the law say that, that rape is. But we, we, we definitely have noticed over recent years an increase in a small number of boys being really quite hostile to those discussions and absolutely I think it's down to the impact of those kind of um, social media influencers like really virulent misogynistic. I think we do also see the impact of pornography and how female sexuality and heterosexuality is depicted in pornography. And I, I, I do think, to, for, particularly for really young boys in their formative years of sexuality, to see um, depictions of sex involving women enjoying debasement and pain, I think there is absolutely no way that is not going to impact their view of what sexuality actually is. And I, I think there's a real challenge for us about creating safer spaces for having much more nuanced and realistic discussions about sex and about women's bodies and about women's sexuality than the, the, there is currently. And also just to pick up on Graham's point about peer groups, I think this is so important to think about how do we change the norms within peer groups, particularly male peer groups, and enable men to feel more able to challenge other male behaviour. So thinking specifically about my job at Rape Crisis Scotland, where we, we, we do see 
men targeting very, very drunk women for what they would say for sex, but to me really clearly it, it, it would be rape if somebody's too drunk to consent. But that notion of predatory behaviour being tolerated by mere male peer groups, this is where I think men often, I think there's a real appetite for what can I do to make a difference. And this is the thing that I think men can do is to stand up and to speak out when they do see other men behaving this way, if they feel able to, or just not to collude with sexist behaviour. And I think we've seen, for example, Andy Murray, the tennis player, I think really shown us how to do that well in terms of not colluding with sexism and not laughing it off. And I think we really do need more men to be taking that kind of approach. Graham, I think that ties in with some of the work that you've been doing. How do we get men to have these conversations? How do we get that change within the peer groups? You know, I think going back to what Nancy said very quickly is that you know we need to make the connection between them, so what Sandy's saying as well, between words and language and what you were talking about, Sandy, about rape and sexual violence. That was the whole aim of um, the, 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 that guy campaign. But for me, we need to invest in conversations. We need to be going to where our boys are, where our men are, um, having these important conversations. Because in my work, and you know, I'm quite sure if I asked the men here in the room just now, okay, let's, let's do it. You know, raise your hands, guys, if you are uncomfortable when you hear your friends maybe saying something inappropriate, something sexist. Let's just to the men in the audience, how, you know, are, you, are you uncomfortable? So the reality is individually we are. Um, raise your hands again, guys, if you, would, if you would respect another man for challenging another man's behaviour. So, so there you go. That's just starting to break down norms already. And I think we need to get into these groups, into peer groups, into football teams, you know, anywhere where, where boys are and have these conversations and start to really help them better identify what their friends are thinking. Because if you, if you look at the, 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 the Mayor of London's campaign in the last couple of weeks, the Mate campaign, great campaign, right? But it fails to understand the difficulties that young men have to actually say, hey mate, right? But if, but if they start to know that people in their peer group support them, they're more likely to do it. So that's what we need to be doing, creating these conversations, investing in these conversations. Don't lecture our boys and men. They deeply care about these issues. And it's about understanding them, them better and helping them understand each other. Talking about those spaces, what role does sport play specifically in this? Uh, it can be a positive or negative impact we're talking about here. Yeah. Sports has always been a platform and always be, will be a platform for social justice. And it's a, it's a great opportunity to, you know, to go into, into sports. I, I had a great opportunity a few years ago to work with the Chicago Cubs baseball team. Fantastic opportunity to work with these guys, you know, elite athletes. And we sat down and talked about them as a team, them as individuals, and we, we developed a set, of, a set of values, the Cubs way, the courage to do the right thing, the urgency to get it done, and the belief that they can make a difference. So, there's, so we then applied that to these issues. You know, distractions off the field become distractions on the field. And I think it's really important. It's a, it's a really a sort of empowering way to have a conversation with, with, with men in positions of leadership. You know, we need more men in leadership to be taking a stance on these issues. And again, it, you know, we're, not, we're not avoiding the conversation with men as victims of violence because, I said at the start, men are the victims of most violence in this world at the hands of other boys and men, and we can't, we can't ignore that. So I think sports is a great platform. Um, I don't think it's used to a great effect in this country. It could be a lot better. Um, but yeah, great platform. Nancy, uh, why do you think boys might be drawn to misogynistic content or beliefs in the first place? I think there's, there's a really um, great theorist called Ray Wynne Connell, um, an Australian scholar who talks about hegemonic masculinity. And I think that defines what we're talking about here really well. Um, and she talks about almost like a triangle with hegemonic masculinity at, at the top and different <coughs> forms of masculinity within this triangle. And she tries to, to understand the way that, that hegemonic masculinity is the most valorised within our society. So it's often um, white, um, heterosexual, powerful, rich, um, sporting men that, that fit this ideal at the top. But it's also really important to see that actually a lot of men don't fit that ideal and are equally as, as pressurised and as, as victimised and, and disempowered by this ideal of, of masculinity and always thinking that they need to kind of achieve this, this form of masculinity. 
And hegemonic masculinity valorizes violence. It valorizes misogyny. It, it wants to kind of put other forms of, of masculinity and, and women below, um, be, below themselves. And I think that needs to be the starting point, seeing that, that women are disempowered by patriarchy, but so are men. Okay, and so, so looking at that, and I think that needs to be that initial conversation. So rather than pitting and saying, actually, boys, you need to do this and girls, you need to do that, looking at how all these groups of, of children or young people are, are disempowered by, by the structures within our society to start with. Some of the, the work you've been involved in has sort of actively influenced policy change. Can you take us through a bit of that and uh, the impact it's had? Yes, yeah, so um, some of the, the research that I did was within schools and looking at what young people thought about men's violence against women. And it'll come as no surprise, it was really hard to get into primary schools to talk about these issues. There was a lot of head teachers that said, nope, we don't want to talk about that. Domestic abuse doesn't happen in these nice leafy suburbs of Glasgow, so you can't come in here either. We don't want you to talk to young people about sex. We don't want you to talk to them about violence either. So that was the initial issues that I had trying to almost kind of get across the, the school gates. But then talking to, to young people about the way that they understood um, themselves, understood gender and understood relationships was really significant in then coming to, to the parliament. Um, and I, I, that's where I first met Graham. We both came to talk about um, these issues here, um, but also talking to um, local education authorities. So going in, one of the most significant um, findings that I had um, was looking at how young people defined violence. And boys would say, sorry, all of the, the children said that violence involved two men um, in a public place, physically fighting. There was, um, a, you, you were able to see the consequence of, of this violence, black eye, broken arm, and someone in authority would come along and say, that's wrong, stop doing that. So that's what all of young people thought that violence was. And so when girls, the girls of age 10 and 11, talked to me about their experiences and said, well, sometimes, in a private place, a boy will come along and he'll hit me or nip me or ping my bra or say something, but no one else has heard that. So I'll go along to the teacher and say, this is my experience, this is what's happened to me. And the teacher would invalidate that experience by normalizing it, by saying, it's because he likes you, be quiet, don't encourage it and it won't happen again. So that invalidation, there was no consequence. That boy bro wasn't brought to account. And so the girl then internalized that as, oh, this is just something that happens. So then later, when it would happen again, there's no point saying anything because my experience won't be validated. And it was that particular example that happened in school after school after school that I went to the councils and said, this is what's happening in your schools. It's not necessarily the fault of individual teachers, but that culture of how the teachers deal with this kind of behaviour. And so from then, I was able to go into schools and develop training and also kind of work with organisations such as, as Rape Crisis Scotland um, and some of the work that Graham did with, with Mentors for Violence Prevention and, and develop ways to, to try and stop this this invalidation of, of girls experiences and challenging um, those examples of violence that were happening. Sandy you've been involved in the rape crisis movement in Scotland for over 25 years now talk us through firstly a bit about the the work you've done in conjunction with Nancy that she was just referring to there. Yes we developed it, it must be around t 10 years ago we started to develop a prevention program to do work in schools because we realised there was a real gap there for young people in terms of having a space to talk about relationships, to talk about what consent meant. So it started off as a, a pilot, but we, we, we now work with thousands of young people right across Scotland every year. And the experience we have is very much informed by the research by people like Nancy, and it also very much validates her, her findings. Like what, what we find, what young women and girls say to us is really what their experience is, what I would term sexual assault within schools 
on a daily basis. But as Graham refer referred to, it's so normalised that it's not been named as that. So I, I think there is a really, really worrying picture there about what our girls are experiencing in schools on a daily basis. Uh, I, I think in terms of a positive, there is some really good work happening. Like my, my daughter's in primary school and I've been really impressed by what's in the curriculum, like what the school are teaching in, 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 in terms of um, respect for your boundaries and for your, your body. And in terms of secondary schools, as well as our prevention programme, we run a project called Equally Safe at Schools, which works with partner schools, involving young people as leaders within that school to be thinking about what are the elements within this school environment that make it less equal for girls? What are the ways we could make it a safer environment? And I think that is the kind of work we really need to build on and we need to make sure that every single young person in Scotland has access to those kind of spaces to talk through these issues, including um, boys and, and young men. So I think it's really important if we're going to bring young men and boys with us, which we absolutely need to if we're going to redefine masculinity. I think it is really important that we're open and that we're not making boys feel defensive as part of this conversation. Otherwise, we're just not going to reach them at all. I think part of, and Graham, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think part of the Don't Be That Guy campaign has about being asking men to have those sort of awkward conversations with themselves as much as with their friends and try to recognise some of their own behaviour and how that, and they, you know, in their minds, maybe 15, 20 years ago when they were young men, they would have thought this is, this is the lads, this is banter, and not realised the impact that it was having on the women around them. How do we get men to kind of confront those? Yeah, the, you know, the first part of that guy campaign was, I, I remember being, I was speaking after the horrible murder of Sarah Everard, which we'll all be aware of, I remember got on tele Scottish television and you know, pleading with people to make the connection between words and language and other forms of violence and abuse in society. And that, that was the birth of the, the first, first sort of iteration of the film, which looked at you know, starting off at these behaviours and how it can lead to other, other things happening. And that was exactly that. It was, it was to get people to, men to self-reflect. You know, we weren't speaking to them directly, we were getting them to think, to think about their own behaviours, their own attitudes, and seeing the impact. And then the second part of the film, second part of the campaign, was to was really using that science of prevention, which I talked about earlier on, about you know, four ordinary guys, not, not celebrities, just ordinary men, speaking about how they felt as individuals, and then thinking about that sense of loyalty they have to their friends. You know, I'm not being a good friend if I don't say something to them. We do it on the field, we do it on football fields. If, someone behaves wrong, we'll say something to them, but why can't we do it in the pub? Why can't we do it you know, in, in the street? So the, the, the two films really were just, as, you know, followed the work of one of my friends, Alan Berkowitz in the States, who talks about just giving, giving men the tools to do what's right. Um, not just saying, do this, here's what you can do and, and, and making it okay. So as I said before, it's about just going to these spaces and having these conversations. Because I think you know, men and boys deeply care about this stuff. And, but unless we have these conversations, they're left thinking, well, I care, but does my friend care? You know, other people around me care, so we need to really open that up. What advice then would you give young men, say they're in that social setting and they're experiencing, uh, you know, as we mentioned earlier, that kind of discomfort from something that their friend has maybe said or done, how would you then advise them to have those conversations? It's, it's a really hard conversation isn't it? To, for, 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 for me to say to boys individually. I know Alan Bissett, who contributed to the campaign as well, he's written a good book, just come out, Lads, it's called, it's called Lads, and it's designed for young men to have the conversation. And Alan gives them some really good tools in that book, um, but it's... It's when, you know, are you, are you, have you got the courage to actually have that conversation in the, in the bus or out with your friends? But it's just about, you know, you know for, for me, it's about just bringing it up in conversation, right? You know, do you have to speak to your friend in front of everybody else and say, hey, that was wrong? No, maybe just change the subject and have a, a conversation with them on their own, that one-to-one -one that's a bit safer for you to do so. So for me, it's we need to give the young boys the tools to be able to have these conversations, um, but to do it safely. And that might sound really like I'm excusing. I'm not excusing the behaviours here at all, but we're dealing with, we're trying to unpick thousands of years of patriarchy, and you can't do it just overnight. So it's about giving them the more tools and giving them the confidence, but I think any adults who are working with young boys and men, you know, create the space to make it easier when they are out in the bus or on the sports team. Because if we can create the space where it becomes easier and they start to listen to each other, they might then be able to say, hey, can you, can you help me out here? I've noticed this. 
can you give me a hand? You know, because when they start to better understand what their friends think, they don't have to do it on their own. They can get allies, engaging allies is a, a tool for, for any bystander. I think part of the campaign is recognising as well that, you know, what starts as what we would consider innocuous banter. It's almost like a, it can be in many cases a pathway. It's that first step towards dehumanising women. And then once you have, once someone is dehumanised in your eyes, then they just feel like an object to you. And then that would then ultimately lead to more serious events, you know, sexual assault and rape. Is that something that in your work with Rape Crisis Scotland, do you see that pathway? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And I, I think that is why we really want to encourage men and boys to interrogate their own attitudes, but also how, how willing they are or how much they feel able to challenge when they do um, interact with people who are making sexist jokes or engaging in sexist behaviour. I mean, I, I think what one thing um, that, that both depressed me and also gave me some hope was the recent, just last year, the signing by Wraith of David Goodwillie, who was found, um, as you know, to be a rapist in the civil courts. Um, and what was really depressing was here's yet another club um, signing somebody who is a rapist, but the community response this time round was so strong because it's, it's a community football club. There was one really lovely man in particular that set up a, a fundraiser for us in response to it. And I, I thought there was really something significant about the response to the signing just last year compared to when he signed for Clyde a number of years ago, where I think it was just maybe us and one other people that, that spoke, spoke out about it. And what I took from that, like hopefully not just being too optimistic here, was it maybe there is a bit of a shift? Uh, I think there was a real sense of shock after Sarah Everard's murder, then there was Sabina Nessa, and a, a whole number of, of, of women that really were, 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 were raped and, and murdered and that demonstrated just a, really the overwhelming scale of violence against women. Um, and I, I remember a lot of those conversations at the time were about what can men do? And I, I, I do hope that there has been at least a little bit of a shift in the past couple of years to people maybe being a little bit more willing to speak up and to challenge behaviour that really goes against women's fundamental human rights in the way that they, they might not have a few years ago. I think the, the example of David Goodwill, I mean, for, for better or worse, I spend a lot of my time involved in football. And I remember when that happened, there were some people saying, well, you didn't say anything when he was at Clyde. Yeah. But I, I, rather than seeing that as you know hypocritical or, or whatever, I actually thought that was a positive. I thought, like you said, that kind of illustrated that the conversation has shifted in those few yeah, years since that, since that, that exactly. Absolutely, what I, I, I took from it. And also, we don't want people to feel that because they haven't spoken out before, it invalidates their ability to speak out now. It is never too late, I think, to step up and to challenge this type of um, condoning of violence against women. Nancy, research from Amnesty International found that in the lead up to the 2017 general election, minority ethnic female MPs received 35% more abuse on Twitter than their white counterparts. We touched on earlier the idea of intersectionality. How is violence against women affected by other forms of discrimination, such as racism? I mean, it, it is. Um, you know, I think that's when we look at um, violence through that intersectional lens, we know that women from, from different classes, um, from, from dif different ethnic minority backgrounds, disabled women experience violence disproportionately, but also that access to help um, and the opportunity for help is, is disproportionate as well. Um, so we could look at that, that further victimisation um, because of, of their, their backgrounds. Um, so no, it's, it's really important. And the, the Twitter examples are ones that I use with my students to try and illustrate that point. So we look at, um, you know, we're here in the parliament, we look at the, um, the abuse from, from MSPs. We know that several um, female MSPs have resigned because of, of the abuse that they get within the media, um, on social media in particular. Um, and it's, it, it's really important to, to look at the disproportion because of, 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 of different um, aspects that they might have in terms of intersectionality. You've written about women's lived experience of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. In what ways are women negatively affected by men in that area and how do we go about addressing that? Um, in lots of ways. <laughs> um, 
So one of one of the pieces of research that, that I did was looking at, at women's experiences of the criminal justice system when they reported um, domestic abuse or stalking. And we looked at it right the way through from um, the police all the way through to court. And it won't come as any surprise to, to the people here to know that we didn't get many women that had reached the court process. So the majority of examples were looking at women's experiences from the police initially. And we had some fantastic examples of brilliant police officers, um, really supportive, listening to women and women feeling like they were heard, which was important to them. So not only telling their story, but feeling that they were listened to and something would happen um, on the back of that. But we also had examples of police officers in quite high up um, positions of power who invalidated those experiences who said to women that talked about the rape of their, from their husbands and um, maybe you just don't like sex so we had examples of women who we know that women who've experienced violence might never go to the police and we know that those who do really take a long time to, to be supported and, and to go through that process so then to be faced um, with police officers or support um, that, that didn't um, support them through that and invalidated that experience um, meant that sometimes women didn't take um, that any further, they didn't want to go um, to, to the courts and often um, before they could even get to that point as well um, the, the case was withdrawn or there was found to be not enough evidence. What work has been done? You've talked there about the kind of attitude, the old fashioned attitude of some of the men towards women in, in, in the criminal justice system. What work has been done, and it could be on a smaller or bigger scale, in the UK to try and change those attitudes that you're familiar with? I mean, there is a lot of work, and one of the, the discussions that Graham and I often have had is that it's so disparate and it's, it's that need for, for joined up thinking um, and I think that's one of the things that we're all really excited about in terms of equally safe because that was the the Scottish government's way of saying right there's all these great organizations that do all this fantastic work so let's bring it together let's create this umbrella for education to, to educate within schools within organizations about gender-based violence and I, I think you know I am really proud to, to live and to work in Scotland because the work that we do here is is phenomenal you know, it's, it's not solved all the problems by any stretch, but in, when you look at the rest of the UK, we are light years ahead, and I think we need to, to acknowledge that. Um, so in terms of, of bringing together really good practice, I think that's something that, that we are good at, mm -hmm. but we also need the money, the funds, um, to be able to carry on doing things like that as well. Graeme, tell us a bit about your work in the Violence Reduction Unit. Well, that was, that was a big part of my career. Um, the best nine years of my policing service, actually. You know, I came to the violence reduction unit as that hang em, jail em type police officer, right? And um, I remember John Carrick and my boss basically saying, take your police hat off, son. Son. Um, but really what he was getting me to think about was just think differently. You know, think differently about an age-old issue of violence. And, you know, and Nancy's alluding to it. We often look for short-term responses to issues. And the violence reduction, it was about a long-term strategy. You know, since 2004, we've, our homicide rate has reduced from 160 odd murders to like 57, something like that in the last, you know, we're, we're not jumping up and down and celebrating and say, hey, we've solved it. There's still people losing their lives and families affected, but we need to be hopeful that we are thinking differently about how we address violence. Um, so I really started to think long and hard about, you know, one, what violence is. So going on what Nancy talked about, your research taught me to look wider than just a physical act and start to sweat the small stuff. And I'm not, I'm not saying verbal is small, but society has got a habit of, what's that phrase, don't sweat the small stuff. I mean, you've all heard that before. You know, there's bigger things to deal with than small things. When it comes to violence, we need to address things like verbal abuse, emotional, you know, coercive control, all these types of behaviors, which society, us, tend to minimize. Not people here, but generalize, we tend to minimize. And especially if it's on, online, it's minimized even further. But that's where we need to be focusing on, focusing on these types of so that's The violence reduction made me think differently about how we define the term violence. And then also, you know, there was some research done in America in the, in the 80s which suggested that third parties witness 
the build-up to the situations, the incidents themselves, and also the aftermath. So that's hence why I started looking at bystander approaches to talk about violence. You know, imagine a Scotland where we equipped society with the tools to notice things, not just at the time of an incident like sexual assault, but words and language. And, we, and, and, you, and your ears pricked up when you saw that as a harm. And that's the time to intervene because, you know, psychology suggests that violence and abuse will evolve and continue unless we see interruption. And that's, that's where the bystander, that active bystander comes in. We all have the potential to, um, you know, stop things from moving along, but we also all have the potential to say to a victim, hey, that wasn't your fault. Simple thing that all of us can do. So we started to talk, you know, introduce that into our high schools. Um, but, you know, I left the VRU and retired from the VRU um, in, in 2017, and it's just given me a passion to take it into different places. I tend to let Scotland do its own thing now because there's some great work going on here, and I don't want to stand on people's toes um, to do that, but I still from time to time do these types of events, and it's nice to speak about it. But there's some great work going on in Scotland which we should be proud of, very proud of. Um, but we all have a, a collective responsibility um, to address issues here. Sandy, I just want to ask, what's the one thing that you would like boys and men to be thinking more about? Well, that is quite a big mm. question. Um, I, I, I think it would be helpful to, uh, I, I think, to, to, to find a way to step back from all the cultural assumptions, particularly about <coughs> female sexuality, and to create a space where we can have much more healthy conversations about sex and about gender stereotypes. I think that is one of the most important things we can do, but it's how we can create those spaces, exactly as Graham was saying about conversations, how we can create the spaces for young people to have those conversations to start to really change our culture. I, I, I do think our law, um, our criminal justice system has a role here to play as well, I mean, there's many documented feelings in terms of how it approaches rape cases and totally fails to act as an effective deterrent. But one, one thing that I think is going to be really interesting is the government are going to legislate and misogyny to introduce a misogynistic harassment offence, which I think could be really interesting. But also, I think what we need to think about is about really supporting any legislation with some real proper community engagement work to be working with communities around what is misogyny. Because I think until um, girls in particular, but girls and women are able to name misogyny, any legislation is going to be useless until the police are willing to recognise it and to respond effectively. The legislation is not going to be effective. But also I think it gives us a real opportunity to work with boys and young men around misogyny and what misogynist, misogyny is and what it looks like and also what role they individually but also collectively can play in challenging it. Nancy, you've all, over the course of this discussion so far, at various points you've talked about the work that each other has done in this field and I know you're all familiar with each other's work. Nancy, how important is that idea of collaborating, of bringing your kind of shared experience together? Oh, it's really important. I mean, one of the things that I love about working where I work, I love working at a university, I love working with, with students that, that come in and want to, to learn about these issues, but I really value the fact that I can do research, but I've got lots of different organisations to then work with to, to do something with those findings. You know, I'm not the kind of academic that wants to do some research, write it in a big book, put it in a library and nobody ever reads. You know, for me, it's really significant that there are so many organisations who want to work with that evidence base, you know, that want to be able to say, this is what we're doing and, and this is the proof and this is the reason why we're doing that because the research highlights, highlights that. And I think within Scotland, there is that real transparency between academic findings, between policy makers, um, support agencies that, that all work together um, with, with the parliament as well, and um, with the government, sorry, um, and, and bringing those, those findings and actually doing something with them. That to me is the most significant part of, of the job that I do. What's the most kind of common objection that you come up against in your work and how do you counter that? Um, I suppose the main one, which I wrote a paper called What About the Men? 
um, is the question that I always get asked at events like this, um, not like this, but at events um, and in the work that I do, I always get asked um, what about the men, because we know um, from the research and from um, you know, the, the statistics of the organisations that work, that we are working with a, with a gendered issue. So we know that women are more likely to be victims of domestic abuse, but men are more likely to be victims of, of abuse from, from other men, as, as Graham has, has mentioned several times as well. And I think the answer to, to that is we need to look at gender. OK, so it's not about what about the men. We, you know, we're not kind of saying we're not interested in, in men's victimizations, but I think it's when people try and turn it on, on its head and look at men's victimization by women. So we know that there are instances where, where women are perpetrators, but often women are perpetrators because of the experiences of violence that they've had perpetrated against them. So one of the first pieces of work that I did when this was the Scottish executive, not the Scottish government, um, was to inform the gender definition of, of domestic abuse that, that Scotland now uses. Um, and we went back to all the men um, who had said that they were victims of, of domestic abuse and interviewed them um, about those experiences. And we found, I think there was 35 men um, or 30 men. And of those, um, three men had experienced um, very quite significant violence from a female partner, but the rest were perpetrators of, of violence against women. And so we need to, when we look at um, domestic abuse we need to to focus on those gendered aspects of it so whether that's that's women as, as victims or how we valorize forms of gender and forms of masculinity in, in terms of violence so gender is is really significant so when we ask what about the men what we should really be asking is what is it about gender inequality that makes this such a massive issue Sandy, I'll put that question to you as well. What is the most kind of common objection that you come up against and how do you respond to it? I, I, th I think there is always the accusation that we're demonising men by naming the problem as men's violence against women. And I, I, I think that is, is, is untrue, but it, it also is, as I said earlier, is, is something we need to be really careful to avoid in terms of... Um, not uh, making men feel too defensive or too under attack to engage with us in these conversations. But also, I think it is totally legitimate to be talking primarily about women's experience here, because this is very, very much a gendered issue in terms of women's everyday experience of violence against women. So we've got one more question before we turn things over to the audience. And I want to ask all three of you this one. So we'll start with yourself, Sandy. You mentioned earlier the misogyny harassment offence. What kind of other legislation or initiatives would you most like to see brought in? I think the misogyny legislation will be really important. Um, there, was, there, there was one case that really highlighted for me the need for it. And pe people may um, remember a case, um, somebody called Adi Egan, who was what's called a pickup artist, who would harass um, young women on the street. Um, he was eventually arrested, convicted, and he had his conviction overturned in appeal. And, and part of the reasoning for that, the judge said in his judgment, compliments are not a threat and I thought that was quite extraordinary but also what, what, what that gave light to to me was this idea that the law is neutral and that offences are neutral. The way our criminal offences are written just now, particularly breach of the peace type offences, are very much written for men in a traditionally male pattern of how threats are experienced and takes no context of the reality of women's life. Any woman would know just how frightening that could be to be in your own, an isolated spot, being consistently targeted by a guy. And I think there is such a gap in our criminal law in being able to reflect or respond to the reality of women's life or girls' lives. So I think the misogyny bill will be important, but as important as I say as the legislation is the work we do is support it. There is no point legislating without doing awareness campaigns to make sure people know that that's um, an offence and the community engagement work. And similarly, 
There's a bill going through Parliament just now um, looking at reforming how we respond to rape in Scotland. I mean, the, like, like most jurisdictions, we really, really struggle to respond effectively to rape. Most cases don't get to court. The ones that do, it's the lowest conviction rate of any crime type. So we've got a bill going through Parliament just now that I, I think could really transform how Scotland responds to rape. And I think that is so important because I think at the heart of so many of these conversations is sexual violence. I think it's intrinsically linked with how we view masculinity, how we view sex or particularly heterosexual sex. So I think this bill is really important and supported by the conversations that we're having today. Nancy, how about yourself? What kind of legislation or initiatives would you like to see? Um, I agree with everything that, that Sandy said. And I think just to, to kind of add to that, for me, it's the naming of those experiences and the naming of that violence is wrong that's really important. So women, when they've experienced that, it's someone else saying, you're right, that behaviour is not acceptable. What you experienced isn't right. And, and I think those laws can, can act to, to validate those experiences um, for women and, and young girls. So, so for me, the, the misogyny law would be able to, to do that, to say, actually, those experiences that you had aren't right, and this is what we're going to do about that. Because I think for so long, women's experiences aren't inval are invalidated and, and they're not named um, as, as wrong, and I think that's significant. And how about yourself, Graeme? Yeah, it's, it's a shame, isn't it? We have to have a law to protect half the population from the other half of the population. And that's, that, that makes me feel really uncomfortable as a man, but we have to have it. It's there. But what I'd like to see is... Um, Something that the, I think Youth Link Scotland did this a few months ago, where they, they did a, a survey-wide Scotland for young, young men's attitudes. I'd like to some, see something where we involve all men, not just young, young men, all men. Um, a sort of a really proactive, positive conversation about masculinity in, in Scotland. Um, I think that would be a really, really useful tool, not just to address the issues we're talking about today, but to, to just issues of men's violence against men, and another form of violence against men that is not, that is talked about to an extent, is men's suicide. Men's suicide is violence, self-directed violence. And I think that type of survey, that type of conversation that we would have in Scotland would be a really powerful, honest, frank conversation that would start to, because when you think Scotland did their survey, they came up with some really positive, positives about young men's attitudes, really positives. So we, and that, that, that's a great starting point for all the stuff that we've been talking about today. So I, I'd like to do something like that. Great. Now, I'd like to, at this point, invite the audience to participate in the discussion. We've already got some hands going up. If you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand and keep it raised until the microphone is passed to you. It would be helpful if you could keep your questions and points brief to allow as many people as possible the opportunity to participate. So we'll start in the front row down here, because that's the first hand I noticed. Um, my question is for the whole panel. Do you think there's a correlate between pe parents who physically discipline their children and gender-based violence, and particularly imagining someone who's grown up being told, if you do something wrong, you deserve a smack, and then when they're in a relationship with another adult and they perceive their partner to have done something wrong, they think, oh, they deserve a smack? I'll try and take that one off. You know, I remember in the VRU, we were discussing that idea of violence gets results. And the earlier we teach that, teach that, but you know, so we live in a place in Scotland, in Scotland where we we criminal, criminalised, you know, um, de yeah, decriminalised, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I think it is important that you know, violence. If we're teaching violence gets results early on, that is going to continue throughout. Those were the exact words the young people that I spoke to in school used. You know, she did something wrong, so she got, you know, told off for it. Um, so it was kind of replicating that relationship between a, a man and a woman and um, a, a parent and a child. So, yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, have you got a follow-up on that? Follow-up. Um, does any of your research or organisations work in collaboration with, like, parent advocacy groups and gender-based violence groups, since there does definitely seem to be a link? Like, you can't fight this battle without working together, I guess. And I think because... 
Scotland's decriminalised it. There were a lot of issues and a lot of debates at the time. Um, I think we probably need to speak to England about that because they're less, they're uh, a lot more reluctant to um, to engage with those kind of debates. But yeah, it's important. Okay, we'll take one from the front row on the other side. So. Um, my name is Bryce, um, and I've got I'm, I'm autistic, and I've got and I'm neurodiverse, neurodivergent, and I'm and basically, I was in during my schooling, I was basically legally discriminated against. I was actually removed from sex and relationships education because I was told I wouldn't understand it. Basically, and I've had to really learn a lot as an adult of what sex and relationship education is. And I think this comes down to the core. And I'm going to be quite be, be quite bold and quite courageous. What I'm up to say here, I think, and I'm saying this with some anger in me because I'm because I've also been a victim and a survivor of domestic violence from my father. I am just so, it makes me feel angry inside that through education, through schooling, and through to, and where you just get sex and relationship, sex and relationship with education, consent-based education, when you go into university, when you go to colleges and universities, they're not made as mandatory to go to or to private sector pri private sector training like for example in, like in for example um football um under under un, uh, young football teams who are training centers it's not made as a mandatory subject to study and the the problem which i'm seeing right now is that and i'm going to be i hope i hope you can understand this come from a place of love is that we see religious organisations who are coming into this debate, asking people, asking for parents to have the right to, to opt out from this education, to right to opt out from this, because basically it's because of religious reasons. And that, I believe, it, we need to come to a secular point of this. We need to allow everyone to be educated. And we need to get this made mandatory because the thing is this, oh, this comes back down to education about what people learn. And we need to have this in place because right now, I myself have been excluded. I wanted to be trained. I wanted education. I wanted to be a good person in society. But I was repeatedly excluded because I was told I wouldn't be able to understand. And that is something that really makes me angry. It makes me frustrated. And I just want to be as I want to be a good person, want to be a good pe person. And when we see universities who, who I mean, we're now seeing, we're now having to see now a, a petition which has been courageously being put forward by Ellie Wilson, um, who's on social media, about ending um, sexual assault and uh, sexual harassment and assault in universities, petitions. We're seeing safe spaces being set up now on Instagram through the safe space that was on recently on television, which is fantastic for women and for women and girls for that. But we need to bring the education back into this. We need compulsory education. We need we need we need to build we need to build this and we need that's because that is where the loss needs to needs to go to. We don't need to because the criminalisation of like all these things could be res, can be resolved. But the thing is that we cannot get this here because of course we're going to say all oh, that's going to be it's going to be, we can't do this we can't do that because basically because because the base of all the churches will say or or any other different other religious organisations will say no we need to have an opt out we need to have an opt out. We can't have an opt out. We need to have a compulsory based education where everything is taught about misogyny, everyday sexism, and all these cultural issues. We need to teach them at school and we need the pupils to be there. I'm sorry for being authoritarian, but I really am just deeply passionate about this. And I'm sorry if I've overtaken this time here. I'm really, I'm just feeling, I just feel that I want, I want to be a better person. I want to education. I want to unlearn. I want to be a good man. But how can I be a good man? Thank you for yeah, yeah. Can I, can, I, can I respond to that? I think it's, it's important what you've said there is, 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 is it's a reality. When I started working with schools in 2010, I came up against head teachers who didn't want to talk about violence in the schools. And I, I remember thinking, right, how do I influence them to think differently about engaging in these subjects? 
And I remember watching a TED talk by a, a wonderful American teacher called Rita Pearson. And she, she talks about every child needing a champion. It's a fantastic TED talk. And there's a, she quoted an American educationalist, uh, James Comer, no significant learning will take place without a significant relationship. And when I started to go into schools and talk about the need to talk about the issues that you, you guys talk about all the time, because sexual harassment, sexual violence impacts not just as a victim, but impacts on learning. You know, it impacts on the ability of a young person's um, ability to learn in school. And you, <coughs> excuse me, in universities, I worked with the University of Edinburgh for the last six, six years. And I said to them right at the start, I'm only gonna do this if you make this compulsory for your sports leaders to be part of this work. So we need to have the, you're right, we need to have these brave conversations because at university, you know, gender-based violence is affecting the student experience. It's leading to, you know, students leaving, you know, su suicide, a whole range of things as well. So I, I think all of us would agree we'd, we'd love to make this. And in, a lot, thankfully, we're starting to turn that tide now, I think, in Scotland. We are starting to have that conversation. So, but, but, so, but we, we need to have an act of parliament mandating that to all organisations and actually having a piece of legislation saying you must yeah. teach that. You must teach that. Because the thing is, this was, as somebody who, uh, as, a, as a man here, I would like to know how I can be, how, how I can be an ally, how I can be an accomplice, how can I be a feminist, how can I be that way, and how can I be able to do that in a way? And I'm 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 a bit homeless in that because I'm struggling. I'm I'm always trying my best to do something, and and the thing is this: so I don't want my I don't want anybody to go through. The violence and, and the and the destruction I've seen my father cause me and my mother in my life. It destroyed my relationship and that. And I just don't want to see that happening any time at all. And I don't want to see it happen to anybody in anybody at all. Thank you. I come in the compul compulsory ver versus no before we move on to our next question. Just I'm, I'm really sorry that was your experience. I don't think MD should be excluded from sex education or uh, education and healthy relationships. We recently de debated ourselves at Rape Crisis Scotland, should it be compulsory in schools, for example? Um, at, at the moment, the biggest issue for us is not school, not having to persuade or force schools to do is, capa is capacity. There is more demand from schools than we can meet. So there is definitely an appetite there from schools to engage in this work and to bring this in with young people. It just needs to be resourced further. And I also, I do share your concerns about religious, uh, the impact of organised religion. But we have also worked in Catholic schools as part of our prevention work and actually had a really positive engaging experience. So I think there are real positives out there that we can build on if work is resourced properly. Thank you I think so you're demonstrating that you are an ally by the fact, very fact that you are here, that you're seeking out this information on social media and you're wanting to make a difference and all of those factors are really important. Um, there's an organisation called White Ribbon, which I'm sure you've heard of, um, with men that work um, to, to end violence against women. So maybe that's someone that you could t look um, if you haven't heard of them already. Um, but I'd say having, having that, that passion and, and that anger because of your own experiences, but also wanting to, to make those changes, you know, is, is really significant. So thank you for asking your question. The Bryce talked there about, as you said, about being an ally, wanting to be an ally, wanting to be a feminist. Is that something that you've found in your work that a lot of men are kind of unsure as to how to go about that in their lives? Oh, definitely. I mean, even when with a lot of the, I think we're aware of, of so much that goes on and it is examples like Sarah Everard where it brings it into the public eye and um, for, for right or wrong reason you know people would say well it's it's because of you know she was white she was middle class for these reasons but I see it as well anything that that can bring that attention and and generate that that anger and, and that desire for change um, and I think from on the back of that I know that I mean, I've got four sons um, and two of them are teenagers and off the back of that were asking me what could they do. They know the field they're working, but I think sometimes it's, it's something that, that triggers that, that need, that desire to, to want to change things that's, that's important. And I think we need to, to harness that and support men who do want to make those changes. Okay, we'll take some more questions. Okay, uh, second row. So my name is Erin and I'm part of the advisory panel for young women, oh, one, 
Young Women's Movement in Scotland, and I was also um, part of the panel earlier today on activism. And I did my dissertation on femicide in the US, so this is a very relevant uh, topic to me. But one question that popped up in the panel earlier on was about um, violence against women on social media and if it should be regulated. If, do you have any thoughts on that? Because my personal opinion is that yes, it should be regulated, but there is and there should be consequences, but there's a fine line on like identifying and using photo ID purely because of um, intersectionality reasons. But I just wanted to ask your opinion on it because we talked about it in the panel earlier. De deal with online harassment to a degree because we, we, we know the level of online harassment that women experience is overwhelming, P particularly black women or, or women of colour disproportionately experience harassment. And we also know from the amnesty research that was mentioned earlier, just what a chilling impact that can have in women's participation in online life, which can be a huge part of people's professional and personal lives these days. So I think there is definitely room for further regulation. Um, part of the bill is also going to look at the promotion, for example, of rape online, which definitely is used to chill women's um, uh, or limit women's activity um, online and in d different spaces. So I think we should legislate, but I think we do need to be really um, thoughtful about how we do that to make it as effective as possible. One of my PhD students, Erin um, Rennie, she's doing her PhD on women's experiences of online violence, and she put together um, a questionnaire. She only wanted 50 responses and she got over 300. So I think that kind of demonstrates the, the depth of the problem. Um, but if you maybe email me, I could put you in touch with her. I think my perspective, uh, you know, taking aside from what the, the last two people have spoken about, is it's the role that we all have to challenge our friends if we see them behaving inappropriately. Um, I think that to me is something that would reduce the, the impact on, on legislation but send out a very powerful message within peer groups. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, yep, we'll have one over there. Yep, just there. Hi, first I want to say thank you. This panel was excellent. Um, really enjoyed listening to it. My name is Catherine and I'm currently writing my PhD thesis on how adverse childhood experiences and self-esteem affect intimate partner violence perpetration. And I'm doing it at a US university. So Graham, I wanted to ask you, when you've, were there any surprises in these, either the similarities or the differences between talking to boys and men in the US versus the UK or Scotland specifically? That's, I get asked that question a lot. Um, no. <laughs> you know, I think the challenge is, maybe the, some of the language is different, um, but I think the challenges that young boys face in, in the US, very similar challenges that the young boys and men face here. You know, you know, you know in, in America, they talk about the bro code. They talk about that, that unwritten rule about not challenging your mates. And in, in this country, we call it the cock block syndrome or something like that. We don't say anything to our friends in certain situations. So some of the terminology is different, but I think these mandates of masculinity that we, that we, that, that we have um, are something that are yeah, US, you know, I, I work with US police and they'll say to me, yeah, we have different issues in policing, but this, the challenges we have as human beings to challenge our friends is, is exactly the same. So, yeah, I, it's exactly the same. Is there a, an equivalent of, you know, the Don't Be That Guy campaign? Is there a US equivalent of that? There's, there is, actually. Um, I was contacted after we did the, That Guy by Futures Without Violence and they've actually made a, That Guy America, That Guy US really well, actually. I'm sure Joe Biden has supported it. So it's pretty cool, actually. <laughs> ah, it's pretty cool to have it. So uh, if you see it's on the Futures Without Violence, uh, I thought they might change it to that dude or something, but they kept, they kept the same. <laughs> and it's, it's and they've actually, people in this panel have indirectly influenced Joe Biden. Right. <laughs> um, and they've actually kept, they've kept the same script, more or less. Right, okay. Which is really interesting. Great, okay. Okay, uh, I think we had a question in the, the third row. I think you had your hand up before, didn't you? Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rosalind Hardy. I, until the end of March, was working in London long term. And I certainly agree that the, the political landscape in terms of just naming it as men's violence is significantly in advance in Scotland. However, a specific question I have is about 
the impact of lockdown in terms of the socialisation of men and boys and to what extent that's ramped up some of the pressures of loneliness, confusion and vulnerability to misogynistic messages. I was working in community development in South East London at the time that Sabina Nessa, a local teacher, was murdered and some of the worst impacted boys and young men in the school mourning their teacher were the young men who had, the young boys who'd recently been child witnesses of domestic violence, which as we know had escalated during lockdown. And we did all sorts of things like tree planting that the boys were involved in and sort of you know, ways of collectively mourning through arts, etc. But I think I was very concerned about teenage boys in particular spending a lot of their time in the house exposed to pornography, online abuse, the Andrew Tates, we've already talked about porn, and also the times at which boys are, you know, traditionally 16, 17, 18 year olds, that's the time when you're finding yourself, you're going out with your pals, etc. That level of isolation is a, is a much harder time. And um, I, I'm interested, I completely agree that lockdown was necessary in terms of the global pandemic, but the, I think there are still long term impacts. I'd be interested in the panel's views on those. Anyone want to take that one? Um, I, I, I would say that I, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering in terms of the long-term consequences because I think we're still doing the research into that. Um, I think in terms of, of domestic abuse, we know that it was a lot harder for, for women to escape. Um, I'm always reluctant to kind of correlate examples like that to say that that, that increased domestic abuse because I think um, whilst it might have increased, we need to think that that's maybe because men and women were in the house together, not because um, of the pressures of lockdown, which I know that there's been blamed. So I, I suppose just to, to kind of clarify that. But in terms of, of, of young men and boys, I, I mean, in terms of, of everybody, I think it was a really difficult time. And we know in terms of, of mental health, and, you know, Graham's touched upon that in terms of, of, of mental health and suicide among boys. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely research going on into, into mental health in that way. But I think that's a really interesting point that you've brought up in, in terms of, of more research needed there. I think, you know, I remember at the start of lockdown, speaking to my friend Ross Duker, who's a criminology professor um, in Glasgow, and we both agreed that, you know, I think when, when, we, when we all went into lockdown, I think we, we played into the stereotypes that boys will be okay. But actually, deep down, boys were struggling as much as anybody else. Um, so I think that, and then, and then obviously exposure to all the stuff you talked about, online pornography, the men's rights messages that were coming through Andrew Tate and other wolves in sheep's clothing, as I call them, um, really, really made a confusing landscape for young boys. And again, if you're sitting on your own, getting all these messages, then individually you're thinking this, but your friends are thinking exactly the same. They're grappling. I think our young men are grappling with lots of things just now. And that's why I go back to what we said at the start, it's about creating conversations to have meaningful you know, discussions on some of this stuff. How are you really feeling about it? Andrew Tate's come up a couple of times. He's obviously the most high profile example of these sort of men's rights influencers and he's got a huge profile. How you know how do you tackle that in these you know, in the young men and boys who are susceptible to those messages? I mean, a, lot, a lot of people have been saying, you know, you know, don't listen to Andrew Tate, don't you know, don't do that. I think that's the wrong way when you work with young people. It's about you're you're shutting down their autonomy to make decisions. You know, for me, it's about focusing on the, the bits that we are all passionate about, the, 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 the victim blaming, all the misogyny that was going on, you know, creating space around that, but, and then allowing young men to make the, you know, better informed decisions. Because you know, um, I'm a big believer in, in media literacy, helping people be critical of what they're learning online from you know, um, pornography or, or, or whatever that, or messaging that's gonna be. So I think with Andrew Tate, you know, one thing I remember a few, a few months ago, one of my wife's friends, one of my wife's daughters had about five or six friends over. There's about five or six, and all, all young men actually, in the room. It was a, you know, really, and there's other people joining us. And I, I sat and had a chat with them. I said, what do you make of Andrew Tate? <laughs> He's an asshole. <laughs> That's what they said to me. Um, you know, I think most men, most young men are getting it. They get it, but we, we, can't, we can't just rely on that. We've got to create the space for conversations. Okay, I'll take some more questions. Anyone else? 
Okay, uh, I can see a hand there, um, about just in the middle there. Yep, there you go. Hi, um, I'm Katie. I'm the policy officer for children and young people at Zero Tolerance, um, which is Scotland's primary prevention organisation. Um, obviously, my role is focused mostly on children and young people, so it makes a lot of sense to me that we've talked a lot about boys and young men today. Um, but we know for prevention, young people learn most from the behaviour and attitudes of adults around them, not from what we tell them directly. Um, so I was wondering about the panel's views about how we change the attitudes and behaviour of adult men already now, rather than focusing all of our energy on young men and hoping that that future proofs us for violence against women. valid point. It's so easy um, when we talk about prevention to talk only about um, young people and totally ignore um, adults and particularly as adults the role we can play in um, role modelling what equality can look like. Um, I think there is so much needs done uh, in terms of looking at changing the cultural attitudes towards women's sexuality in particular within the adult population. It is the adult population who sit in juries in rape trials, for example, and often what we see being played out over the course of rape trials very much has sexist notions about women's behaviour and women's sexual behaviour. So there's a, a lot more, I think, we could be doing in terms of changing those cultural attitudes um, amongst the population as a whole. I think we need a sustained approach to campaigns. You, you know Rape Crisis is going to be run a number of public awareness campaigns, so this is an invitation to rape me to challenge victim blaming. We also ran a campaign to raise awareness about countering truth responses to rape, that not everybody screams or um, fights back straight away. Um, and it's always difficult to measure, I think, definitively the impact of public awareness campaigns because there's so many factors that can influence attitudes. But definitely the evaluations were really positive. And I think what we need is a sustained approach to public awareness campaigns. But I think we also need to invest in community education work. Um, I, I mentioned that in relation to the misogyny legislation. I think we, we need to do much, much more, or investing much more in community building approaches and raising awareness and increasing skills, giving people tools. And I think only by, I think we need a, an approach that includes legislation. So like the law actually acting as a deterrent. I think we need a community building, community engagement approach. And also I think we need to continue this work and this conversation, particularly with, with, with adult men, around how they can challenge other adult men's behaviour and also examine their own attitudes. Do you see examples in your line of work where men maybe have had these entrenched attitudes and they're now receptive to the idea of change and, you know, having a more modern outlook? Yes, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's an assumption that women blaming attitudes or misogynistic attitudes are a generational issue, um, but we, we, we do see it as much, I think, with young adults. That's definitely what the research seems to show us. It's not only older people that hold these attitudes. I, I think it is possible for people to shift their attitude towards these issues. But I mean, I think there's a lot of research out there about at which point is somebody's views so entrenched that it's very difficult to change them and put as the, the, the best place to put your, your efforts and your energy into people who are open to change. So I, I think it can be really, really mixed. I think there are, there are some people whose views are so entrenched that it can be very difficult to reach them, whereas other people are much more open to, to engage. In. I think sometimes as well it's easy to say, got this captive audience within a school let's let's get them you know let's go in and do that but for me personally one of the reasons I came to to Scotland to do this work was the pioneering work of, of zero tolerance I, I cannot explain looking at those black and white adverts the impact that they had on me and still continue to have today and I think that campaign was so unbelievably significant and using it within football grounds, you know, these were places that we'd never talked about men's violence against women before. So I think, you know, it is significant to, to have those, those public awareness campaigns. And even if they're just, you know, kind of a few people kind of get that message, but um, again, it's the money, you know, the, the time and the money and investing within those as, as well as the other aspects that, that Sandy said. 
Yeah, you know, young people don't grow up in a vacuum, do they? They grow up in a world of adults who abuse, who bully, who drink alcohol, who do whatever. And I think even within our politics, we need to be mindful of the tones we're setting. <coughs> um, and that's something I, I, just, I see a lot online of people, peop, adults who should know better, you know, getting involved in tittle-tattle, which just keeps its way down to, you know, young people's, um, that sense of permission to do something. You know, what you promote, you permit. But we can flip that differently, can't we? You know, it could be a negative, but it could also be a positive. And everybody in this room has the ability to, you know, be kind every single day, to show respect every single day. Little things like that can really start to make a difference. And I think in Scotland, we're such a small population, small country, we can do things really quickly. And I think if we build a sense of unity, you know, that's a massive persuader, you know, you know but that common purpose. Who doesn't want a safe Scotland? Who doesn't want a safe workplace? Who doesn't want a safe school? You know, if we start to build that, we can start to hopefully try and, you know, unpick some of the issues that we're here to, today to deal with. One thing I, I think really set, set us back in Scotland in terms of our discussion around sexual assault was how the complainers and Alex Salmond case were treated just a couple of years ago where it felt like it was open season on them. We, we, we had people writing online basically trying to hunt them down and find out their identities. And I, I think that does speak to what, what Graham was 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 talking about there, just about how how we behave as adults. Like a, a, any time you're speaking, any time you're in the room, there is going to be a sexual um, assault survivor in that room, and how you conduct yourself very much will have a bearing in whether or not they feel able to ever speak out or to tell you or anyone else about their experience. And I, I thought that whole episode, including quite a number of politicians, how they behaved in relation to that. Was, was, was absolutely shameful and really did set, set us back quite a bit in terms of our conversation in Scotland around rape and sexual assault. Really what, what we need to be doing is, is, is create a culture where people can report sexual violence, they can na feel able to name it, they can feel able to report it. They may not get the outcome they want, but they certainly shouldn't be, shouldn't be hounded in the, the way that we saw in that case. Part of the, the Don't Be That Guy campaign, you know, and my involvement in it centred around sport and what I... What I found quite a bit in terms of high profile rape and sexual assault allegations was that people were viewing these things through the prism of the, the football team that they support. Far more serious issues than football, but their first thought was how does this reflect on either the team that I like or the team I don't like. And I think, I don't know if you'd agree that with Alex Salmond and certainly other cases as well, there's been that kind of, for a lot of people, a lot of adults, you know, seeing this through the prism of their own political allegiances rather than, you know, taking a step back. Uh, absolutely. In, in terms of be, being an ally, in terms of violence against women, I, I think where it can really test you is if it's um, the person being accused is somebody that you revere or you care about or that you've admired. I think that is the real test about whether or not you're an ally in terms of how you behave in those circumstances. Okay, we've got a question at the back there. Sorry, there's actually quite a few. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to, you, you kind of keep picking up on misogyny, um, but we're not actually understanding that for a lot of people, for example, in the Muslim community, they do not understand what misogyny means. And their version of misogyny is completely different to what society in general's version of misogyny is. And on top of that, we talk about gender-based violence and we talk about the physical and the coercion and all this kind of stuff. But actually, and I met with the Solicitor General um, last week actually about this, is we need to see in Scotland, because we're the only one in the UK that doesn't have this at the moment, but we need to see in Scotland that the definition of uh, gender-based violence and domestic abuse, which currently has um, an intimate partner down, we need to extend that to extended family abuse because that's how honour killings happen. This isn't just limited to men that are intimate partners. This is also men that are within the family unit. And if you are an Islamic girl, you are likely to be sitting in that house with that family. So there's a multiple sort of complexes to this. And if I just quickly pick up on um, the current issue in regards to Police Scotland, um, we've got the 
chief officer to sit and tell us that the Police Scotland is misogynistic. Now, what we don't have is an action plan against that. So we're going, oh yeah, by the way, drop the bombshell, which fair enough, nobody was expecting. But currently, Police Scotland system is not set up to recognise gender-based violence by their officers as perpetrators. And we can see that just now because there's a police officer that's just recently gone to prison. Um, and when the recognition from the sheriff has been said that there was extended issues at play, what he went to prison for was an attempt to pervert the course of justice not what he attempted to pervert in the first place. So the whole system is constructed in a way that is only going to create this inability or this, this perception that women can't speak up. <laughs> Graeme, do you want to take this? That's a lot of questions there. Um, I think Ian Livingston's um, statement a few few weeks ago was a very courageous statement and a statement which I agree with and was I part of that system as a young cop yes I was um, I have to you know, uh, you know you know say that was part of part of the, the 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 policing and for me it's about how do we create a system where we talk about the good cops how, how do we create a system where these people do speak up and they do act and they do do a lot of stuff that we've we've we've, we've talked about today <coughs> So, um, and that's a lot of the work that I'm doing just now, is trying to give back to policing some of the skills that I have to create cultures where people do speak up, do act, do things early on, rather than wait for the big things to happen. Um, so I think what comes next for the new chief coming in in the next, the next couple of months is how do we respond to that? If I was to be honest with you, I think some of the responses I'm hearing about are not sufficient. You know, there's a lot of reliance, I believe, on online training, which, I don't think it's going to cut it. It's not going to really make the difference at all. Um, because again, you're not breaking down the groups, the peer groups. You're not, you're not, you're not giving cops a chance to speak to each other. Um, and I think there's, a, there's, there's too much focus on leadership, as in senior leaders. Yeah, of course, leaders in policing set the tone, but every police officer is a guardian of culture. I mean, we're all guardians of culture, whether we're in policing or whether we're in whatever organisation you come from. And I think I, need, I want to see more top-down, bottom-up, sort of ground-up approach inside, outside, so we inform what we're doing to the, the communities and the communities then start to direct what we're doing inside the organisation. I see a very, still a top-down approach in, in, my in my old organisation, which is just going to shut people down in the, in, the, in the lower ranks. That's what I see. And I've been taught that through my work with US police in the last couple of years and now piloting some of my own, my own work with English police forces. I've got a meeting next week with some Scottish counterparts, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of work to be done, a lot of unpicking to be done. But I think Ian Livingston has started that conversation. I don't know if I've totally if I answered much of your questions, but there's a lot there. Ian Livingston said that, but how are we perpetuating to other young women and girls that are currently in our society and experiencing sexual violence? How are we going to convince them that actually, no, you can come forward if what actually we're being told by the top guy is, actually, wait a minute, we're actually really misogynistic. Why, why would somebody want to come forward? I think, I think you're right to link the two things. I think misogyny and sexism within an institution that is, is naive to think that but will not impact on how that officer then responds to somebody reporting rape. It's certainly one of the, the biggest issues that we have seen survivors of rape telling us about their response from the police is when they're met with a culture of disbelief. I think there's been really big improvements in police responses to rape and sexual crime over the past decade, although there's obviously still some room for improvement. In terms of acknowledgement of misogyny, I think the important thing is that it starts with an acknowledgement, doesn't it? I think it, the acknowledgement in itself uh, can only be the beginning and what has to come then, as you say, is a really clear action plan. And I, I think there's similar issues about the misogyny bill, that if you've got misogyny within Police Scotland, if it's recognised as being institutionally misogynistic and racist, how will, they, how the, will that same police force then effectively implement a misogynistic harassment uh, offence? That we, we need to link the two things together, I think. We need to link the efforts within Police Scotland to address misogyny within the force 
and link that to making sure that women reporting crimes of gender-based violence are not being faced with a response that's informed by misogyny. So to me, the two things go hand in hand. I think uh, the Chief Constable was right to acknowledge it, but I think what we need to see now is the action plan about what they're going to do about it. Okay, so that's all the time we've got for questions. I want to thank everyone who asked questions today. I also want to, before we close, give each of our panellists one minute to sum up our discussion today on talking to boys and men about gender-based violence. So we'll start with yourself, Sandy. I mean, I, I think what, what's clear from the, the three of us, but also from many of your contributions in the audience, is that there's a real <coughs> consensus here that this is a significant, violence against women is a significant issue, and that if we don't engage boys and men as part of the work to challenge violence against women, we're not going to be successful. And the, the key themes for me that have come out of our discussions and the really useful contributions from you all is about the need for it to be resourced, the need for it to be intersectional to make sure we're bringing people with us and we're acknowledging and identifying the specific um, issues facing different communities across Scotland, but also the need for it to be long term and sustainable because the, there is no point doing, for example, one campaign one year then you don't do something for another five years. We need a long-term sustainable action plan that we're, we're bringing men and boys with us in a way that doesn't in any way compromise the human rights approach we're taking to violence against women and girls. Okay, and how about yourself, Nancy? Um, I think for me, it's really heartening to see men in the audience. I think with the conversations like this, I've so often talked to, to groups of, of women. So for me, it's talking about men and boys to men and boys and not just leaving it all to, to women, which has often been the case, um, especially with this particular um, subject. Um, for me, um, with the research that I've done, um, yes, working with children and young people is, is significant, but as, as Katie said from Zero Tolerance, we need to look at everybody. You know, it's not just um, how can we change the attitudes of, of young people, it's, it's changing those societal attitudes, um, changing those structures, that, that gender inequality, and that starts um, with all of us. Um, so for me, it's, it's really heartening to see um, a big group, a big audience coming to, to listen to something like this, but also wanting to, to engage and start to make those changes. So thank you. Okay, and Graham. You know, I thought about that question when you asked me at the start. You know, you're going to end with this one minute, and I want to relate it to what I call my moral rebel checklist. Right? In society, we have moral rebels, right? People who do speak up, men, women, whoever, um, speaking up. And you know, for anybody who, who's working with young men, with young boys in, in this field and wider fields as well, you know, give them the tools. You know, create the space. You know, where they where they feel supported and that uh, intervening in situations is normalised. It's part of being a friend. Friends don't let friends drive drunk, was the campaign in the United States. Friends don't let friends get arrested. Friends don't let friends you know, be victims, something like that. Um, I think also as well, help them believe that they can make a difference, right? You know, many young men think, I can't make a difference. Of course they can't. Everybody in this room has the power to, to make a difference. So, so and, and create the space to practice. What would you do? What would you say? If you, um, if you came across a situation in the future. And lastly, something we've talked today about character, and, you know, helping young men develop their character, their presence, their values, their core values in the world. Because the, all the evidence says that um, when you do that as early as possible, you motivate people to act, be good, good friends, but you also help them avoid harmful situations as well. So you know, th these, that's my moral rebel checklist, which comes from lots of research over the, over the years. Um, but I think the belief that you can make a difference is a big thing for me. Help your, our young boys believe they can actually make a difference. OK, well, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming along today and for making such a big contribution. Thanks again for your excellent questions. I'd also like to thank our panel today, Sandy Brindley, Graham Goulden and Professor Nancy Lombard for their insightful discussion. And I'd also like to thank our partners at Glasgow Caledonian University. Can I remind everyone to fill in the survey that you'll receive automatically if you booked via Eventbrite. We also have a few paper copies of the survey at the back 
and we very much appreciate your thoughts on how to improve the festival. May I also take this opportunity to remind you that there are many more festival events taking place today, including a discussion on the future of Scotland's arts and culture at 5pm and a discussion on radical uses for Scotland's land at 5.30pm. We also have a full day of events tomorrow, including discussions on navigating migration and Scotland's poverty problem. I do hope you'll be able to join us for some of those. Thank you very much for coming along today.